Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Bitch Side Podcast. I'm your host, the HOD of the BSB. The HOD stands for A for Host on Duties. Um, like, share the video, comment on the YouTube version of this, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, and enable notifications to receive all the updates about the podcast and other videos on this channel. Um, follow us on social media at SidePSB on Twitter, Bitch Side Pod on Instagram and listen to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or whatever you can get it from if you want to. Um, let's get into the meat of the business. Really, Sunday was pretty eventful day, just like um, on Saturday. Really pretty exciting um, weekend of football. And we, you, and we start today with the Premier League, of course. Um, four matches were taking place today, of course. Brighton, Hovey, Albion drawn against Sheffield United. Sheffield United with their second point of this season. I mean, I think it is a remarkable performance from Sheffield United. They really played well, a little bit better than they usually do. And despite the fact that they lost John Lundstrom already to a red card from the 40th minute, they played 50 minutes or so without um, John Lundstrom, 10 man against Brighton. And they had the lead in the 63rd minute um, to, to go forward, really. But it was Danny Welbeck who denied them three points, their first three points of the season, and kept them at two points at the bottom of the table. I mean, it just it's just not happening for uh, Sheffield United at the moment. They really they really cannot muster anything. And it, all, all the signs are pointing down for Sheffield United and Chris Wilder. Unfortunately for the guy, he had a, he had a great season um, last time out, but this time around it, it's not going to be happening, and it looks like everything is telling that Sheffield United are going to be going down this season. There's no escape for it. And then, of course, we had the big match portion of the Sunday as Tottenham Hotspur hosted Leicester City, and this was a tactical masterpiece from uh, from Brendan Rodgers. There's no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. It is absolutely brilliant from Brendan Rodgers. Really, he um, he ma- he mastered he they mastered the master. He was he was even more brilliant than Mourinho. Um, he started the game strong. He pinned Tottenham to their defence in the first 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes, really getting a lot of chances going, um, trying to play the ball in between, trying to get in spaces, using the, the basic players they have. Up front, Madison was superb. His movement and his distribution of the ball was just brilliant and amazing to watch. Um, in the last 10 minutes or so, Tottenham started attacking in a way. They started really moving the ball forward, trying to get some spaces. And that's what Leicester City strike. A penalty given away by Sergio. Yeah, I think a stupid penalty. No debate about that, really. You cannot question the fact that whether it's a penalty or not. Um, Serge Aurier giving a penalty. Jamie Vardy converting from the spot right at the f- death of the first half, really. Right at the strike of half time. And when you're leading at the break, you get all... All sorts of momentum, and when you're leading against a side like Tottenham, you get doubly problem momentum because they defend, they play ultra defensive. That it feels like the lead is always deserved when you um, when you lead against Tottenham at half time. And then, of course, in the second half, Leicester started really, really strong, having a goal disallowed by James Madison, um, thanks to um, by Jamie Vardy actually, thanks to an offside um, rule. Um, then. Uh, then, after five, six minutes, of course, I mean, not even getting to the hour mark, Tottenham find themselves conceding another goal this time. It's an own goal by Toby Alderweireld after the header from Vardy ricocheted off of him. And again, playing long ball, capitalising on the space behind the centre-halves. Sergio here was way pulled out of his position, and it was a so good defending in the box with Alderweireld, and Jimmy Vardy had to so good beaten all day long. And his header ricocheted off Alderweireld, unfortunately for him, to go into Tottenham's net, and two nil for Leicester away from the home and after that it was brilliant game management from Brendan Rodgers he put his side and he plays his side really well he gave Tottenham the possession and just let them die suffocate on it they didn't know how to do in possession we all know that by now I think that Mourinho's sides do not know what to do with possession the best thing they could do is to sit deep and try to be 100% focused on the counter-attack, trying to find spaces behind the defence, which Leicester didn't give, 
because usually you can see uh, players drop in and midfielders drop in with when Kane drops to take the ball. Leicester City didn't do that. They played compact. They played with clear, defined lines. No much space behind them. Son, Heung-min and Kane couldn't really move in the spaces that they usually love to to move in. There was no support as well from the uh, from the fullbacks. Regulon was pretty much neutralized as well as Aurier. And Aurier was taken out. So so that's a sign, I think, of how. How really, um, you know, sidelined he could be. He ended the game with Moussa Soko as a, as a right back, which, I mean, unless Sergio Rie is injured, I don't think there was a reason to put Soko in that side. And it was, it was a suicide completely because Leicester had a couple of situations with Harvey Barnes and Jamie Vardy coming from that side and almost scoring and almost, um, you know, putting the sword on Tottenham, uh, who, again, didn't know what to do in possession, were clueless. They had, like, one major chance in the second half, really, it was on a corner. Hyun Min Son almost scored, only for a brilliant save by Kasper Schmeichel, denying him the uh, opportunity to uh, come back and to get his side back into the game. It was a smart game management from Brendan Rodgers, didn't give them the space that they needed. He he knew how to to place his side. Fofana, man, uh, Fofana is just incredible. He's he's he's, a, he's an investment for that side. He came on from Lille with twenty million euros, something like that, and he's having a tremendous season with that side. It's 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 telling really when you talk about Leicester City that um, they, we're still talking about a side that is not exactly hitting the peak of his form. Yet, like, yes, they had two back-to-back victories now for, for Leicester City, but again, we know, they still somehow didn't hit the form yet. They still could be inconsistent. We can, we need to expect something out of them, probably. The next game is going to be against Manchester United. It's a really important one for Leicester City, as it's uh, as it stands. Um, for, uh, again, for Tottenham, two wins, uh, two losses, sorry, in a row. And not just two losses in a row, but it's the fact that they are winless now in three, and they have to wait to s- and have to wait really to see the, the the other games, and they have even harder fixtures coming really um, later on. The Boxing Day fixture in particular is going to be incredible for them. Um, for Leicester City again, um, it's another win. They're trying to stay uh, in in the top conversation, really, and they're doing really well at the moment. Probably some people would slip on them and would sleep on them, but I would I would say Leicester are going to have a great season, and probably maybe they would about finish better than uh, the last time out. Who knows what could happen, really. But again, the next game is against Manchester United, so it's going to be a big one to watch. Um, Tottenham face Wolves the next time out. Um, away from home, that is going to be tough as well. Speaking of Manchester United, uh, they hosted Leeds later on, and it was bonkers, as I mentioned in the review. It was really, really bonkers the way they, uh, the way they, the match panned out. Three minutes in, Man United were two 0 up thanks to Scott McTominay. The first goal was a tremendous strike from Scott McTominay, just pinged it into the left corner of Melier. Um, from first view, and I thought it was like uh, it was like it was sneaking on the on the ground, but in the the replay, of course, it was travelling that shot upwards into the net. Um, after that, United a little bit of regrets somehow. They tried to let Leeds play the attack in football, the suicidal football, I call it, that Barcelona Bielsa sort of playing, really playing all out attack and leaving so much spaces in behind for sides to capitalize on him. But, um, for, unfortunately for Leeds, those spaces and the mistakes, of course, from the midfield in the first goal in particular, a giveaway, the second goal as well, the third goal, um, was a, uh, was a penal, the third goal was a marking mistake from the corner. Um, third goal was a giveaway as well. The fourth goal was a marking mistake on the corner for far post for Lindelof and, and I'm talking, they were 4-0, like Man United were 4-0 and they were leading the game comfortable. They were really looking good sometimes. In 37 minutes they were leading 4-0. Leeds missed a couple of chances in between when the score was like 1-0 or 2-0 to, to bring the game a little bit closer to uh, to, to their reach. But um, a combination of bad finishing plus De Gea pulling some saves really um, meant that he won't be doing that. Um... 
in the second half, and of course, after scoring later on in the first half, Leeds United scored in the 43rd minute, meaning that they had a second half of epic proportions, apparently, but it was all to nothing as Manchester United managed to hit them and kill them dead, really, with the uh, goal from Daniel James in the 66th minute, after Leeds United having a great period in the first 20 minutes. They were really close on a couple of occasions for Rafinha, for Moreno and for Bamford to score the, uh, the the second goal and maybe give it a go and make it even more nervy for United. Like, it was 4-1, but somehow it was really nervy for United because Leeds kept pressing, keeps kept playing this uh, you know, jelly football of sorts where players do not stick in their positions where you can see right backs moving into the box or centre halves trying to play in the midfield. Like, it was all sorts of weird anyway. Um, Bruno Fernandes made it six from the penalty spot, and after that, like the last 20 minutes, they were bonkers, really. Uh, the whole match was bonkers, but the last 20 minutes in particular were just subnormal to watch. Like, De Gea was saving balls from here. Melier was saving balls from here for Man United. Chances were missed from this end and chances were missed from the other end. This game could have ended 10-5, 12-7, I don't know, something that basketball, football that everybody seems to hate for some reason. The game was superbly entertaining. Stuart Dallas made it 6-2 in 73 minutes. A beautiful goal, by the way. No chance for David Hare catching that. Um, it was only a matter of time. You know, before, I mean, I expected other goals, really, and, and it showed, like, it should have been at least for United 9 or 10 goals. They should, like, realistically speaking, they should have been 9 or 10 goals for United in this game, but somehow they didn't score them. Um, it ended 6-2. Good performance for Man United, but it's not a standard, really. Leeds United are probably the only side that are going to be playing this kind of suicidal football in the Premier League. No other side is going to be looking at that and saying, oh, we're going to be copying this way. Absolutely not. Marcelo Bielsa, all respect to him for not staging his his style, pretty much. They look safe, Leeds United. They seem in a decent position at 14th, but you don't know. Like, it could really go down really quickly in the Premier League if you don't keep the momentum. Important victory for United, again, they would take it. A comfortable home victory, eventually. Um, not if, not comfortable in all of its details, but on the whole, it's generally comfortable by a good margin. A great performance, capitalising on the mistakes, being clinical, that is, I think, what United, let's be honest, does best under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for all the discredit, for all the criticism that that guy um, uh, has been receiving. Um, the end of the Sunday action was West Bromwich hosting Aston Villa. It was quick work from Aston Villa. 3-0. The first goal was pretty early uh, from Anwar Al Ghazi inside five minutes. And after that, West Bromwich, you know, um, loyal to their sort of traditions this season, it seems, playing 10 man for the rest of the game. 37 minutes in, Jake Livermore gets sent off. And Aston Villa have a goal disallowed in the 72nd minute, of course. It was all Aston Villa all game long. It was domination. It was possession-based. Football, 19 shots for them. 10 shots on target, including, of course, the three goals. It took them until the 84th minute to add a goal uh, by Jack, by uh, Bernard Traore, sorry. Bertrand Traore from Jack Grealish's assist. In the 88th minute, Anwar Ghazi. Um, scoring the penalty that was drawn out by Jack Grealish, of course. 3-0 for Aston Villa. Easy victory uh, in the end as well. Not in the details, but in general, it's a comfortable victory. Aston Villa are really looking good. West Bromwich Albion. Sam Allardyce or no Sam Allardyce, um, they're going to be going down as well. That is what, um, what is obviously, it looks like the way for them at the moment. Seven points. They could still save their season. It's not like Sheffield United. They could still have some good results and save their season, but I don't think that is going to be working. For Aston Villa, they move up to ninth, and of course, with two matches still missing, um, and they still have two matches in hand, they could probably go as high as second, potentially, on the table, um, or, uh, you know, they could, really could go as high as second, third, right behind Liverpool, maybe. It, 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 I mean, Aston Villa are having a great season. Now I think they're guaranteed uh, that they're not going to be going down, they're not going to be scrapping for relegation. Everything that they're going to be doing from here onward is going to be a bonus, I would say, and it's going to be a plus uh, for them. Uh, the round finishes on Monday. Burnley hosting Wolves um, on 6.30 and Chelsea 
hosting West Ham in a London derby at 9pm. That's all for the Premier League. Let's move on and move on we do to La Liga, of course. And round 14 was concluded, of course, on Sunday by four matches being played in La Liga. Celta Vigo in their fourth victory in a row. Uh, make it 2-0 against Alaves. Um, a goals coming on in the... Um, in the um, 19 minute by Bright Mendes and the 79th minute by Bright Mendes as well. A brace for the guy in the game. Celta Vigo turning their season around. That was it. Well, that's what all I can say for them. They really turned their season around. The last four matches, four incredibly important victories. And not just that, conceding only once in these goals. Defeating Granada, Athletic Bilbao, Cadiz, the surprise package of the season. Four goals only in the first half in that game. And, of course, lastly now, just defeating Alaves. They turned their season around. Celta Figo at the moment are sitting... Um, you know, at uh, eighth on the table, they really turned things around uh, at the moment. I mean, four weeks ago, we were talking about a side that was scrapping for relegation and probably would have been a hard season for them. But no, it isn't to be. Four wins in a row. They turned the um, the the season around pretty much, as I mentioned, and they really change um, their destiny. It seems it's going to be incredible. It's going to be an incredible season for for Celta Vigo if they manage. A great finish out of this. Of course, the next couple of games that they have are going to be crucial. They have uh, a move to Hetafe, then, of course, hosting Wesker. Then, on January 2nd, right after the furthest day of the year, the first match is going to be away from home to Real Madrid, and that is going to be incredible. Then, have the Real, Real Betis, Eibar, Granada, and Atletico Madrid. That's the first five fixtures they're going to be having in 2021. Um, a turnaround, incredible from Celta Vigo. I'm really impressed by this kind of turnaround. Again, four weeks ago, I was meant probably expecting them to go down, to be relegated, but never. They made four victories in a row, and four crucial victories in a row. Not just that, they are probably the best side in form in the league at the moment, alongside Real Madrid. Um, one of the sides that Celta Vigo beat was Granada, and Granada managed a 2-0 victory against Real Betis at home. This new victory for Granada would put them six behind um, Barcelona, of course, with two matches still in hand for uh, Granada as well. Um, they could go high, really, they could go really close to the table. Atletico Madrid still have three, by the way, on the top of the table. So it's it's a whole mess, I think, of a of a schedule. But we're gonna, but hopefully, it gets sorted out and and organised. Um, Cadiz seemingly lost the plot completely. I would say losing against Celta Vigo four 0 and now losing against Hetafe two uh, 0 at home. When you're on a side that beats Real Madrid and Barcelona and puts Atletico Madrid on a test, really, and then you succumb to Getafe at home, I don't think. I don't think that, um, you know, that you have enough stamina, probably. Um, Kadeef, I mean, this is probably an expected regression for Kadeef, um this season. The game wasn't theirs, really, by by any chance, just like any game from from this season. Um, they had some good opportunities, but Getafe were more dangerous, far more dangerous for their liking than they would have hoped. A 2 nil victory for uh, Getafe that would put them... Um, <clears throat> a 2-0 victory again for Hetafe that would uh, put them in a really decent place, I would say, on the um, on the table. Uh, really, they are 11th. I mean, they should be moving up at the moment. They they stuck in the middle of the table for too long. Uh, and for a side that last season was really close to the European spots and, and playing in the Europa League pretty much. This um, this is not quite the season for Hatafi, but maybe it still will work out. And in the big match of the evening, of course, a ball in Iperua hosted Real Madrid. Um, the score line of 3-1 to Real Madrid might suggest that this was a comfortable game, and at a certain point it was. In the first 15 to 20 minutes, Real were playing some of the most sublime football uh, you could ever ask for, really linking up pretty well. A bar at certain points were not even touching the ball in the first 20 minutes. Six minutes in, Karim Benzema finds himself in the space. Long ball from Rodrigo, brilliant pass. Finds himself in the space, makes it 1-0 for, um, for Real Madrid. 
and it's and it was all about you know the link up play and the, and the quick movement and the transitions uh, the movement of the ball from the players the wingers and and Modric really having a masterpiece of a game overall uh, as all uh, and scoring a second goal of course after the set set up from Benzema brilliant finish right in the roof of the net from the uh, young Croatian World Cup finalist after that after the second goal and not just after the second goal I mean after 20 minutes really they continued to pressure they thought they could score the third but the offside ruled uh, out the goalie from um, Benzema in 28th minute right at the stroke of, 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 of half an hour Kike Gomez for a bomb makes it 2-1 with a brilliant shot I mean go out of your way to watch that goal really it is it is it is deserving of a of a Pushkesh award. I mean, it was really hard. The ball was dipping really low. Courtois had no chance, but only swimming at the ball, trying to catch it, but he couldn't. It is two one for Real Madrid. Abar got one back by half an hour, and they knew it, and they bounced on Real Madrid. They put them under some sort of pressure. Real Madrid were playing with fire a lot, trying to get the ball from the back. Um, I mean, even Ramos at certain situations looked shaky, and you don't say that a lot about one of the best defenders in the world, if not the best defender in the world. Um, you know, Abar found a lot of spaces behind uh, the, the midfield. They started pressing high. They forced Real Madrid to uh, li play a little bit condensed to rush their passes. The pressing was uh, distracting for the midfielders for Real Madrid. Give away a couple of giveaways from Casemiro, from Varane, from Carvajal. Uh, Abar had great chances in the first half to make it 2-2, but the the finishing was, was really lacking. The decision making was not that good from the attackers, the Kanshinui and Yoshinori Mutu. Brian Gell, I mean that guy is incredible. The number 25 in, in, in Abar, he had a terrific game. He tormented Carvajal, especially after the two goals of Real Madrid. He tormented Carvajal for the rest of the game, uh, running and, and dribbling past him, crossing to his teammates and, and trying to find spaces. He was incredible all over. The first half ended 1-2 and you knew straight away that there's going to be a nervous second half for Real Madrid. You expect that to happen really for a side of Real Madrid who leave it really late to settle the deal. Uh, and the second half started with Real Madrid a bit strong really in the first 10 minutes trying to kill the game off dead but they couldn't uh, do that uh, to their liking uh, a bar after 60 to 65 minutes uh, into the game they started realizing they need to attack again they're still in the game Real Madrid didn't score so why we should impress any more they continue uh, to press higher and they forced other mistakes out of Varane and Ramos had a giveaway that almost cost a goal and again the decision making from the A bar player wasn't uh, if Iba plays wasn't exactly on point, um, as you look at it, really, it wasn't exactly the best um, kind of uh, decision making. Uh, Real Madrid by 75 minutes, they completely regressed to the back. I mean, for real, Iba pushed them uh, to to their zone, pinned them into their defense, really, for the last five to ten minutes, but. When you miss the chances against Real Madrid, you knew that you're going to be getting punished. And in the 92nd minute, Abar missing a crucial counter head to head. Ramos with a brilliant tackle, saving Real Madrid two points really for that game. And on the other end, the, thr the throw in resulted from that tackle leads to Karim Benzema setting Lucas Vasquez for the third goal. 3 1 for Real Madrid and away victory of epic proportion takes them joint top just behind Atletico Madrid on goal difference. But of course, the big asterisk in this is that Atletico Madrid still have three games. Uh, that they didn't play really, so this the, the the lead could be very much stretched to around six to nine points maybe if Atletico Madrid win all of their games. Important victory for Real Madrid. It wasn't as comfortable as it might sound in the end, but they would take it. They would take the victory whenever it comes and however it comes, and they will pick up the pieces and pick up the momentum, of course, before taking a well-deserved rest um, next week, of course, before returning the week after for some big, big fixtures uh, ahead of them in La Liga. Um, let's um, move on, of course, now um, in Serie A and in Italy. Seven matches were played in Italy. Torino drawn one all with Bologna. Of course, Torino continuing 
The poor seasons that they've been having at the moment, they are standing at 18th with 7 points this season. It is just it is just bad form really for a side that has one of the best strikers in Italy, the prime striker it looks like in the Italy alongside Ciro Immobile and Andrea Bellotti. It doesn't look really good for them. Um, drawing and have another bad result against Bologna. Uh, Benevento defeated Genoa 2-0. They're really having an incredible season considering the standards really that you expect from Benevento. 12 uh, at the table, 15 points. It's very decent again considering uh, that is a side that everybody probably expects to go down and to be relegated. Cagliari drawn one all with Udinese, um, with Cagliari of course. Um, sitting at 13th, Udinese 11th, it was pretty close, they were pretty um, tangled and, and they were just above each other on the table before the round started, of course. And now let's come to the big people, the big big boys, the top table portion of Sunday's action. AC Milan moved and draw and went to the Mape Stadium facing Sassuolo, of course. Um, and Milan made a brilliant start, the first... 30 to 40 minutes were just incredible. Rafael Leao scoring the fastest goal ever for AC Milan, the fastest goal ever in the Serie A. Uh, in, inside the first minute, six seconds exactly. And they had a 1 nil lead. Chananoglu made it 2, but only the VAR to disallow it. And they continued to play strong AC Milan. 26 minutes in. Alexis Salamakas adding the second goal from the Teo Hernandez assist. That guy is just brilliant. Teo Hernandez is one of the most pivotal players for AC Milan. After that, they sort of regressed a little bit. They sort of gave the, the game to Sassuolo to dominate and to uh, play more football than they like. Sassuolo certainly had uh, opportunities and certainly had attempts on target, but um, they were forced away, of course, um, by the Milan defence and Milan goalkeeper. Um, the goal from Sassuolo coming in very late, only as a sort of a consolation for Domenico Berardi. It was too little, too late, probably. And by the 89th minute, uh, the deal was done for AC Milan. A victory, another victory, another victory without Abramovich, another victory without another victory without Ben Nasser, without Rebic, without a host of other players for, for injuries, really. I mean, they are proving that other credentials, really. They are proving that they are Paul favourites to win the Scudetto this season. And certainly they're making more than just a fair case for their Scudetto credentials, really. They want to win the title this season. Zlatan, not just Zlatan wants to win it. They seem like everybody has believed that realistically AC Milan could win this Scudetto this season and could manage an important change of the of the tides, really, in Serie A. After years and years of Juventus dominating, it is going to be now back to AC Milan, of course, um, winning the title once uh, again. If they do that, it's going to be an incredible achievement, considering you shouldn't that is that they hasn't been they haven't been gradually moving up in the last couple of seasons. They haven't been like moving from mid table to Champions League places, playing in the Champions League, and then you know being strong enough to compete in the uh, in the Serie A and win it. Not like for example Liverpool in the Premier League, where they moved upwards a little bit under Jurgen Klopp and they played in the Champions League and they failed the first season and then they won the Champions League the second season and improved a lot and then they won the the, the title of course last season by basically running away with it. I don't expect Milan to run away with the Scudetto because um, there's other sides we're going to get to that are breathing down their necks on the table, but not necessarily a far-fetched dream now because in the first seven to eight weeks, particularly after the derby, the Milan derby, I was pretty worried, pretty concerned not to judge Milan too far and too fast. Um, so I had to wait a little bit, but I think by now I could say that yes, Milan are title contenders, ball favourites to win this. It is. I'm not going to put any more pressure on the, on the Milan fans, but, I, but I'm going to dare to say that this is Milan's title to lose. I think it's Milan's title to lose, really, because they're leading the race. They are at the top. They should be going about their business really seriously if they want to do anything of note this season. I think the worst they could have is, is, is a top four finish. That is what I expect. Is the top four finish, the worst that they could have at the moment is finishing in the top four and just playing in the Champions League, which is 
something that you don't want to say a lot, but certainly this is going to be um, really, 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 really incredible for uh, Milan when they eventually do it. If they do it, they still have a lot of players missing. So when they get those players, imagine how strong and how impressive Milan would be. Speaking of Milan and another side in the city who are breathing down the neck, it is Inter Milan who defeated Spezia 2-1. Um, same, probably same thing, just like their counterparts, their red counterparts in the city. They made a quick, quick work of uh, Spezia but it needed a little bit of going the first half wasn't exactly the best that they uh, could muster really they didn't have the best of situations in the first half and in the second half the spaces of course opened up for Spezia who moved up high up the pitch and left themselves really open for Ashraf Hakimi who is growing up to be one of the most pivotal players in Inter at the moment he's more important than Eriksen and he's more important than some other players in that midfield he's really an extra striker, a sort of extra winger. It, it almost feels like a 3-4-3 three, for three, four, uh, for Antonio Conte, not just a 3-5-2, where Hakimi is a winger back. It feels like Hakimi is an actual winger on the right-hand side, with Lautaro Martinez on the left and Romero Lukaku playing in the centre. Um, 71 minutes in, Romero Lukaku converts from the penalty spot, makes it 2-0. That was about your lot for the game. A little bit of a scare later on, when Roberto Piccoli scored in the 94th minute for Spezia, making it 1-2, um, of course, again. Copycat between the uh, the red side and the blue side of the Milan City. Is it going to be condensed in that city? Will we see Juventus running away and escaping, you know, uh, waiting for some gifts from those sides? Milan are still undefeated. Inter are still in it. Probably they are favourites in some sorts, maybe second or third, because they don't have European football to worry about at all. Maybe the the schedule is going to be way more comfortable for them that they don't have European football, so they can have the rest when the other teams have been playing Champions League or uh, or Europa League. And in the case of Milan, the Europa League is a grueling competition because they have an extra round of of matches before the round of sixteen. Um, then, uh, of course, you have to question how Conte is going to be feeling about that because. Antonio Conte's season now is all about um, winning the Scudetto. It's it's win the Scudetto or leave for Antonio Conte because the way they left to the Champions League is embarrassing, I would say. They had an easy job to do, I would say, against Shakhtar. Again, they dominated and they had the chance to go through and, and just score one goal and, and they go through. That is, that's about it. They squandered it. They lost the opportunity. And they didn't even make it to the Europa League. They're just out of Europe altogether. So it does suck that um, you're going to be having to uh, you to play every game like it's a cup final. Play every game. It's a game for your life, really, for Inter Milan. That is what they should be doing at, at the moment. And that is what they feel like doing. They are one point, of course, behind AC Milan on the table. 34, event, 34 Inter, sorry. And Juventus with 27 points, already drifting 4 points from AC Milan at the top. This could be a hard season, this could be condensed between AC Milan and Inter Milan. Hopefully we see more than that really from other sides. Speaking of other sides, one of those other sides were Atalanta, who hosted AC Roma. And it looked, uh, in the first glance, in the first half really, they looked like they're going to be heading towards one of those you know, performances that... They have been churning out this season quite a while, uh, not being convincing at all. Edin Dzeko from the third minute, scoring by the assist of Henrik uh, Nikatarian, of course, making it 1-0 for Roma inside three minutes. And Atalanta, from there onwards, they panicked. They couldn't score the first half. And at the break, it looked like they're going to be heading for another loss, another bad patch of form. But in the second half, they just exploded on Roma, scoring four goals, of course. Duvin Spata opening and equalising for Atalanta. Robin Goss has made it two in 70 minutes. Luis Muriel, 3-1 in 72 minutes. And Josip Ilicic made it four inside uh, 85 minutes. I think, again, Gomez not starting, not even coming off... Uh, not even coming off the bench, really. It looks, I mean, for some reason, when you keep someone like Papa Gomez on the bench, I mean, he was out of the squad, actually, for, for this game. You don't know what he's going to be doing, really. It seems certain like that guy is leaving in January. 
you don't care how much Casperini is going to be trying to deny it, but that guy is leaving and he's going to be a commodity. He's going to be a demanded player because he's a proper number 10 um, in, in, in the game, really. Any team who lacks a number 10 would probably go swoop him straight away. Um, AC Milan probably are in the lead for him. If he goes there, it's going to be more strength to a side like AC Milan who have incredible younger players who could really benefit from his brilliant and well-weighted passes into the channels. It's going to be a shame for Atalanta, but it's going to be a win for whoever side gets to uh, have his services. And in the later game, of course, on Sunday, it was Lazio hosting Napoli and defeating them to nil goals. Um, from Chiro Immobile and Luis Alberto, either side of halftime, meant that Lazio are going to be winning against Napoli, who played really well. They, didn't, they weren't really exactly the worst team in the world. They played really well. They had more possession. They had more chances to show for it. But it wasn't their day. Lazio were the better team. They were the better outfit. They won on the day 2-0. And that would mean that Lazio will be 8th now on the table with 21 points, of course. Atalanta 21 at 7th. Um, uh, let's talk about the table very quickly. AC Milan 31 points at the top. Uh, as I mentioned, Inter with 30. 27 for Juventus. Roma 24. 23 for Napoli at 5th. 23 for Sassolo at 6th. Atalanta 21 with Lazio. But Atalanta still have match in hand. Hellas Verona 20. Sampdoria 17. Udinese, 15 points as well as Benevento, Cagliari, 14 points alongside Bologna, Parma, 15 with 12 points, 11 points for Fiorentina and Spezia, and Torino, Genoa and Crotone with Torino and Genoa, 7 points, Crotone, 6 points, that is your relegation zone for you in Serie A. Just to finish quickly glossing over the Bundesliga, of course, only two matches played in match day 13, that league is going to be taking a rest as well. In the next week or so, uh, Freiburg defeated Hertha Berlin 4-1. That was a comfortable victory for Freiburg, really. Uh, made in a quick work of them in the second half in particular. It was three goals in the second half. Vicenzo Grifo opened the score line before Dujulika Bakio equalised for Hertha Berlin. Uh, Demirovic made it two in 59th minute. Manuel Gulde made it three from Vicenzo Grifo assist in the 67th minute. And in the 94th minute, Neil Spedersen from the spot made it 4-1 for Freiburg, an incredible victory for Freiburg, really, they have, they've been having a good couple of victories as of late that moved them up to 10th, really, and finally they start moving up the table, a side that has a very decent season last time out, and Wolfsburg, of course, in a very tight game between two sides that are incredibly uh, well performing this season, defeated Stuttgart 1-0, it was a tight game in every aspect of it, in the stats, um, it 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 meant that Wolfsburg are going to be top four in the heading into the Christmas period. Twenty four points at fourth for Stuttgart, eighteen points at seventh. But they shouldn't be ashamed. They really have an, a good season, and they will be obviously a uh, very big number. Uh, to mess with and forced to be reckoned with this season. Glossing over the Bundesliga table really quick after this 14th round and before the break. Uh, Bayern Munich top with 30 points, 28 for Bayer Leverkusen and Leipzig behind him. VfL Wolfsburg 24 points, Dortmund with 22 points at 5th. 21 points for Union Berlin, 18 for Stuttgart and Borussia Mönchengladbach, 17 points for Frankfurt and Freiburg, 16 points for Augsburg, 15 for Hoffenheim, 14 for Werder Bremen, 13 for Hertha Berlin, 11 points for Köln at 15th and the relegation playoff zone, Armenia, Bellafield with 10, and in the definite relegation, FCV Mines and Schalke 0 Fair with 4 points at the very bottom of the table. That was that for the review episode of the Pitchside Podcast. Like, share, comment on the video, subscribe to the channel, enable notifications to receive all the updates from the podcast and the other videos on this channel. Follow us on social media at SidePSP and Pitchside Pod on Twitter and Instagram respectively. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts or wherever you can get it from. Until I see you tomorrow, hopefully, I was your boy, the HOD of the PSP, HOD standing for host on duties and goodbye.